It was October 30th, 1995, when Quebec's sovereignty referendum came to a head, in which the motion to secede from Canada was narrowly defeated by little more than 1%. It was a particularly tense time, of course, for Anglo-Quebecois relations, and it provides a suitable paranoid backdrop for Good Neighbors, a new darkly comic thriller directed by Montreal filmmaker Jacob Tierney. It stars Emily Hampshire alongside two of Canada's most successful Hollywood exports, Jay Baruchel and Scott Speedman. Set in Montreal's Anglo-dominated Notre Dame de Grasse neighborhood, better known as NDG, Good Neighbors follows the increasingly tense relations between several apartment residents who struggle with social eccentricities each other and the threat of a serial sex murderer on the loose. The film also marks a reunion for Jacob Tierney and NDG-raised Jay Baruchel, who last worked with each other on Tierney's acclaimed film The Trotsky. It's, of course, been a hugely successful year for Jay Baruchel in Hollywood. Good Neighbors just had its world premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival, and I'm pleased to welcome director Jacob Tierney and actor Jay Baruchel back to Studio Q. Hello, lads. Hi Hello. there. That's a, oh, very well Hello. done. Yeah, yeah. Jinx, private jinx. You really have known each other. You really have. Very nice to have you here. We Congrats. can't even speak without each other. <laughs> Clearly. Congrats uh, on the birth of another film. Thank, Thank you, man. Thanks, Thanks for having us. You must be excited. Yeah. So this is based on the novel uh, Cher Voisin by uh, Quebec author Christine Bruyer. Uh, in adapting it for the screen, so you opted to set this during the 1995 referendum, which the novel is not set in. Why? Um, I mean, a bunch of reasons. The biggest reason is that th I read this book for the first time during the referendum. I was in high school, and um, I had a, a very cool French teacher who I used to complain to. Uh, all of our books were French. The books we had to read in French class were from France. And I said to her once, like, can, I, can you recommend to me a Quebecois book that I might run the risk of liking? And she gave me this book, and I loved it. And it was during the referendum. I read it that winter, like that fall and winter. So uh, for whatever reason, those two ideas kind of became conflated in my mind. Um, and then what it came to mean later to me was something a bit more... Uh, a bit, a bit more kind of like red herring-ish to the story is that, you know, I wanted to set up a situation where there was a context that could play out that would that would look like uh, this film, the series of arguments could play out on the subject of the referendum, right. but really they're dealing with these kind of interpersonal relationships between these The referendum these becomes three. a metaphor. Exactly, yeah. I see. Now, uh, do you remember what, to, the, the, like, how you felt during the referendum? Yes, very clearly. It uh, was horrifying. Well, Jay, you were 13. I, I did was. the math. Yeah. <laughs> I come prepared. So, <laughs> so what you. do you remember about the referendum as a 13-year-old? No, I, what I remember is, uh, you know, and, and I think Jacob was 16 around that time, and, and, you know, neither of us were able to do anything about it in that we couldn't vote, but uh, we both, you know, bore the brunt of whatever would happen. And so I, I just, I remember... Um, it was a particularly strange uh, formative period. I, I, I would never call it pleasant because I remember going to bed that the night of the referendum, kind of my mother weeping as she watched, watched it on TV and I wasn't sure if I'd wake up in another country. And like, and so I just, um, I remember it, it was this incredibly, incredibly polarizing time, you know, and we, it's such a weird way of life in Quebec. And um, at its best, we just keep sweep stuff under the rug a bit, and every once in a while, the lumps kind of get a bit too big, and you have to acknowledge them. And uh, and I just, you know, my mother grew up during the October crisis, so I was always like, grew up hearing all these horror stories of don't go out on Saint Jean Baptiste and lock your doors, and you know, she had armed escorts on her school bus and all this stuff. So for me, it was just, um, it was this weird like. Uh, yeah, what the hell? What the hell's going to happen mm. tomorrow, man? And 50% plus one, that's that's not a real majority. Well, and I'm assuming you're, you're an NDG, you're an Anglophone. Did you, uh, your character in the film, Victor, is on the national side, the Canadian uh, yeah. federal side. Yes, sir. Uh, and, and in fact, he's a very outspoken uh, Canadian patriot yeah. in this film. I think there's actually a line where it's like, I love Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and to a certain extent, that felt like Jay Baruchel. No, I that's... mean, you're, you, you wear that very proudly on your... So th this character you could relate to, I would assume, in the context of the referendum. Oh, I indeed. You know, I, I, um, the, the high school that I, I, I went to, the, for every one of us Anglos, there was three French kids. And so I remember going to school with kids who had like... FLQ written in whiteout on their school bags and all these Bill 101 uh, stickers all over the lockers and we had a a flagpole with no flag on it. And I remember one time me and a couple of Anglo kids went to the principal and said, can we just, can we put a Canadian flag up and you know, we'll, we'll put a, a Quebecois flag too. And he was like, he burst out laughing. He said, we tried that once in 1980. We'll never do that again. <laughs> and so like, no, I, I, I could relate to it. I was always, um, I was always, 
I always had fairly unpopular beliefs. In well, a- I don't want to wade into the the two solitudes debate in this interview because I want to get into the to your film. But but uh, but uh, it's probably dangerous to say this. But it doesn't it wasn't it cooler to be a separatist? For for kids, well, I, like, I I was. Oh, you were. Oh, oh, yeah. oh okay. So yeah, we can yeah. have the two solitudes right yeah, here. Yeah. All right. He's not in... anymore. I should hope this freaking traitor. <laughs> I mean, all right, easy oh, tiger, here we go. easy tiger. So, but you know, it's, I'm just thinking as teens, yeah. it, 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 the being the rebel who wants to leave well, the yeah, country. That, seemed... That's kind of exact. Like I I was I remember very clearly being bored and horrified by the uniformity of opinion among people that I knew, and I that was I mean it was much more of a a kind of a uh, 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 I'm trying to find a word that is not shit disturbing. Oh, <laughs> didn't work well, out. Did well it? done. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> oh, God. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I guess it was a bit more of a, an antagonistic kind of rebellious position to right, take, but right. I certainly had. I mean, I remember. I mean, I know. I know that you were at that rally, but God, I remember hating that rally. I, I was there with my mother. I was so deeply resentful. I was the like, one with the big the flying, the 50 flag. Flag. flying yeah, yeah. people in from Calgary. Like, oh, these guys don't get an opinion on what we. It was. I remember there was a lot of hostility towards Did that. You, but didn't you guys know each other then, or you didn't? We knew who each other were. Yeah. We knew our, our families knew each other. Right. You know, we were like, different high schools. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 and yeah. different different ages or whatever. No, I was in high school with all Anglophones in Montreal West, and I mean. Everybody was a Federalist, and so I found that incredibly boring and so not interesting. So you were just a contrarian? I was a Anglophone contrarian, Club? but I kind of believed it, too. Like, I, 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 I mean, Jay's right in the sense that Jay I is, don't anymore. Jay is palpably getting angry again. I know, again. I know. He, Look, he'll he, do this. What I ultimately have come to believe, and I still believe this then, was that I, I, I can't pick a side in a colonial war. You know, like, I'm not interested in this hundred years British-French thing, whatever. It's like picking a side in the Boer War. It's just not that engaging to me when we still live in a country that is committing the longest, slowest genocide in the history of the world. Like, if either one of those sides had ever decided to take up First Nations issues in any substantive way, I, I think I would have supported them a lot more. Right. Uh, that may, was that maybe a bit hyperbolic? It's like picking a side in the Boer War? You well, know, I mean, like the Dutch versus Montreal. the British, you know? Yeah, like, thank you. Know. Thank you very much. I agree. That was pure hyperbole. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I just tend to got... speak in hyperbole, but, like, I do think there's a similar... <laughs> just thought it was a bit of a stretch for a guy uh, who grew up in Montreal. Yeah, honestly, it's clearly an issue. French versus... Where... You know, it's like... It, it's this old colonial idea that I I, I feel like... But that, it's more than that, man. I I, I mean, like, that, that that's... No, because implicit in it is this idea that there's only two of us here. There's only two solitudes. And right. I don't, right. I get, I don't get believe, that, I just sure. don't buy for, that. Jay, uh, uh, here's your chance to respond no, to your for, old dear friend. Yeah, no, for me, it's just, uh, um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I uh, my mother's family are uh, predominantly uh, 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 military, you know, everyone was uh, either in the army or the, you know, my uncle was a Mountie for 30 years and would guard the queen when she'd come to Canada and you know and my uh, my granddad left his 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 wife and kids in 39 to go fight the Germans and came back alive and reenlisted to fight the Japanese and uh, so for me I was just um, there was never ever a question you know I, I was always raised uh, believing that we had the best country in the world and it was something worth fighting for and uh, I, I didn't want to see them try to to try to tear my country apart you know that's why I'm also um, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite a partitionist, which is a, it was a mini movement that happened in uh, in Anglo neighborhoods in uh, in Quebec, where they said, "All right, if Quebec separates, different neighborhoods can uh, can elect to stay part of Canada. If you're going to tear our country apart, we'll tear your country apart." It's a bit of a vindictive thing, but uh, yeah, no, I got a maple leaf over my heart for a reason. Uh, although not a, not a maple leaf meaning the hockey team, just oh, to be God, clear. Oh God, no! Oh God, no! <laughs> it is definitely not blue. Just to be very clear, it is yeah. definitely not blue. A, a noted Habs fan. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> moving back to the film, uh, more specifically, um, uh, Good Neighbors. Uh, this is a, a dark, almost Hitch, Hitchcockian uh, film. Tell me first of all why you were attracted to making this film. It's one of my favorite genres. Noir, cinema noir is one of my favorite genres, and that's really what it was. Like, I, I love that book. I thought about it for many, many years, and um, it was just, I felt like the kind of perfect, small, fun, malicious little thing that I could do next. And, um, and, and part of it was these three actors, too. Like, these three parts and these three actors. Who I, I wrote this script for these guys, and for Anne-Marie, for all four of them, actually. Um, and, yeah, it, it's a tone, and it's a kind of movie that I 
as an audience member love and crave and I don't feel like we get a ton of them especially when they're funny it's I feel like there's a period where where you know humor was kind of sucked out of uh, noir and thrillers and I I love it when it's in there you know when it's, it's dark it's disturbing and it's also very funny mm-hmm. yeah, so when you write something for you're talking about three actors being Jay Barrett Jay Emily Scott and Scott yeah. Speed so, so Jay do you get a choice about, about whether you do this film I mean I know the last time you were here you said you want to continue making films in Canada but clearly you get optioned a lot of stuff so uh, <laughs> when your buddy says I'm writing something for you yeah. I mean do you do you actually do you let him read it first and decide or oh, is it course. just implicit that he's no no the nothing is no no, no, no it is implicit I told him I'd do it I didn't even need to read the damn thing you know and I, and like reading it was an afterthought Re- reading it was like was like Christmas I was like oh and it's good <laughs> you know I, I told him I'd pick up his dry cleaning what know? would like, happen if you didn't think it was good um, you still do it? Of Would course. Yeah. It's, uh, I, 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 this is this is my boy. Uh, um, as much as he's a, uh, a traitor to our country and his proud heritage, <laughs> I would still take a knife for him and do anything for him. <laughs> I, I mean, it is. Well, fil- I think hopefully, if Jay didn't like it, we would talk about it and work on it and make it better. You know, I mean, that, that right. would be the idea to me. It's like so. I don't, basically, he doesn't have a choice. It's a coll- No, <laughs> he's, that's right. He said he just has that's to correct. workshop it with. I know you. things. <laughs> I know things about him. That- it's filled with these awkward moments. One sensationally disturbing murder scene that yeah. said you've called good neighbors a love letter to ndg <laughs> he can, called it that can, yeah I'm, I'm looking at jay barishal can you explain that <laughs> well it's just um you know it's a it's a it, it's it's we have it's a it's a neighborhood that's very uh, heavy on ambience you know and <laughs> like you know it, it's it's just got um and it's got chutzpah and culture to spare and growing up you know i went through you know pre-puberty to hair in my balls to now and uh, and i just like oh, i boy. was you know is I any was, of this usable <laughs> is this is this ever going to be on the air all of it yes. no but i uh, you hang yourselves my you know, friends I, i've gotten jumped in that neighborhood and i've you know i've done everything there is to do in that neighborhood and i always just saw it as a movie and i always saw my neighborhood as a movie and i remember there's one particular crane shot uh, of establishing shot of the apartment building and um I started crying when I saw Jacob filming it at the monitor because I'd never seen my neighborhood uh, shown the way that I see it in my head, you know. And uh, it, it, it's just um, we nailed down certain aspects of, of that specific culture because our, our neighborhood is not one that many people go to when they come to Montreal. It's To me, it's like the best-kept secret in the city. And uh, and I just I, it was just to have a movie take place there and when we shot it it was called NDG while we were filming it so it as a, a partitionist it's, it's important to you big big deal to as me as the yeah. mayor as the mayor of Notre Dame de Grasse <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is the second unelected uh, you know film with quite a bit of profile that you've you've set in Montreal yeah. so it, it's a conscious decision to, For sure. to to showcase your city right For sure yeah no matter I mean this was a very conscious decision to showcase this neighborhood too because because the book took place in Quebec City um, which is a smaller city I really wanted to localize the sense of fear and to make it that there was a serial killer dealing with one neighborhood instead of all of Montreal because that's a bit less threatening in a city that big. You wouldn't have that kind of. And scary. it doesn't really happen. And it doesn't. It doesn't really happen. Yeah. So I mean, so the idea of setting it in that neighborhood was to make. You know, the idea is that this movie barely takes place outside of this apartment building, so right. that kind of becomes the world. Um, and so yeah, that apartment that Jay's talking about was a whole casting job. And I think more than a love letter to NDG, or, or you know, it's kind of. I mean, love letters. One, but I feel like we gave NDG the gothic treatment. Yep. That was kind of the fun idea of it to me. Was let's kind of mythologize uh, now that we've opened the door let's stick with the two solitude let's stick with the the, <coughs> the, the the tensions in Quebec in as much as they may still exist or uh, have have increased between French and English uh, Jacob you sparked a lot of oh, debate God. here we go after you publicly I gotta ask you about I know, it right I know you know you that I know you a, you're on the national show I know. You, you can imagine it. how much fun it was for me to do Sorcerer's Apprentice press in Canada that's literally all they asked me about was what you're about to mention you 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 you, were, you publicly criticized Quebec cinema saying it was too insular and did not reflect the the diversity of the province you said it was shameful uh what provoked you to make those comments um well it's it's something that i i mean as a friend of mine once put if you've had a conversation with me for more than half an hour we probably talked about this Uh, it's something that concerns me you know it i um I'm a Quebecer. I participate in uh, in that culture and and in make i make films there i live there this is my life and i feel like when i 
there's a case to be made that when you watch TV there when you, and when you watch movies that it is amazingly uniform mm-hmm. and that we don't do, we don't make an effort to, uh, to open ourselves up to, to, in, to allow the, the, the dream of becoming a, a Quebecois to, to people who are not uh, white um, and largely, uh, it's a largely unilingual Cause, cause, issue as well. Because what is a culture, right? A culture changes with every, de- with every right. generation well, and right now, you know, Arabic has replaced English as the second most spoken language in Quebec, right? Mm. And, uh, and, and and it's just you would never know that if you watch Quebec movies or TV. You know, I think I touched on this when I was here for the Trotsky, is that if you watched French movies from Quebec, you'd never know that there was such a thing as Anglo-Montreal. And if you watched Anglo movies from the rest of Canada, you'd never know there was such a thing as Anglo-Montreal. Sorry, Arabic has surpassed English as the second most spoken language in Quebec. Yeah. Really? Uh, yeah. Wow. I mean, you're you're saying you I don't know. know. I just you don't. don't I have know. no idea. That's, that, Does that sound wrong, though? I mean, I have I have no idea. That, that sounds. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, that sounds. Well, wow, that's interesting. I wouldn't well, be surprised if eventually something surpassed English. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. That doesn't surprise me but at you, all. But I mean, Jacob. So you you agree with this? Oh, 150 percent. But one of the points you you made, and you sort of made it right now, was Anglophones and immigrants are ignored, and you call Quebec cinema white, white, white. Mm-hmm. So I mean, there's Anglophones and Good Neighbors, but it's an overwhelmingly white cast, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Are you? Are you there's two, na- there's two native actors in it as well. I mean, to me, it's like a diversity of a reflection of where we come from. Um, uh, you know, this is a sm- movie with a small cast. I, I mean, listen, I'm aware. Like, I don't think I'm not trying to exclude myself from being part of this problem okay. or part of this yeah. issue. I think it's something that we, as a culture, have to look at and have to deal with. Um, and I'm, I also, but I, the only reason I'm hesitant to keep talking about this is because. I don't want to be the topic of it. I'm not, I should not be the topic here. Like that issue should be. And you know, people like Philippe Fallardo and Denis Chouinard and a lot of other filmmakers have talked about this. And, but you and put it on the, that's okay. I you, did. You put but, it on the agenda. People are talking I, about it. I yeah, mean, that's fine. But you know, I think that I'm too easy. Uh, yeah, they're painting a big I'm, target I'm too easy on to, I'm too easy. To, it's too easy to, to make it about me uh, mm, talking right, about it right. and not about the thing that I'm bringing up, which I think that a lot of people in Quebec agree with. Um, you know, we're, we're the new world. We have to kind of open our, our up to this idea right, that, right. and that I suspect, had you said it in Quebec, it wouldn't have been as big a deal. I firmly, because no, because honestly, because Jacob, like for the whole time since we made the Trotsky, you, you've articulated, or you know, you've said things similar to that, and then you know, and nobody really gave a crap. And then we, he went to California, and there was one screening of Trotsky in L.A. where he said one sentence, and look what happened. Hmm. You know, so I have to think that. A, if he had grown up speaking French as his first language, and B, had he said it in Quebec, there wouldn't be a controversy. It's just because he's an Anglo and he said it in the States. Jay, uh, it's, it's, um, we, we talked a bit about the amazing year you've had uh, you. um, last time you were here, and, and you really have, and, you, and Thanks, people man. just love your work, and you're great again in this film. Thank you. I, I, I mean, major Hollywood hits this year, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, How to Train Your Dragon. She's just not too good for me. <laughs> what was that? She's, she's out of my league. She's, just she's out of my league. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's too good for me. I was thinking. Famous she's out of for my his league. research, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, which I, I actually love that film. I've seen Thanks, it like three man. times because it's always on the plane. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. But so saw, does David Suzuki, apparently. That was the weirdest was moment amazing. of the week for me. But but I wonder if um, so. You're here. You're you're still making a Canadian film, a horror film set in yeah. Montreal. Um, do you uh, business while your manager sitting on the other side of the of the glass? Do do, do 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 you get pressure from the industry or or the people around you to to uh, somehow do more Hollywood fare? Are you, is it is it difficult for you to continue doing this kind of work, even when it's with your your good pal Jacob Tierney? Uh, not not at all. It, it it was I'd say um, maybe ten years ago, kind of when I was starting out in the states when I was eighteen. It's been it's been a decade that I've been working down there. Um, and I've never moved there. And I remember once a year for the first couple of years, all my American agents would sit down and give me a real stern talking to where they say, all right, Jay, you have to pick one. You, have, you can live in Canada or you can work in the States. And I would always said, all right, boys, I live in Canada. And I always just called their bluff. And they're like, all right, fine, we still want to work with you. Mm-hmm. And so like, and, and, and also more to a point, They've seen. They've seen that I, I, I do largely my best work in the movies I do up here, and and they support me, and they you know they, they come to every event and they come up to every to, to every movie, and they they realize that this is, this is my career. This is where I do the best stuff, and they and they've seen firsthand that like, I don't know, people like me a bit more up here than they do down there. So they re, they they know we have a good thing going up here. You too, and and Jacob, you, you uh, as we end off here. It's interesting watching you this year because last year, I mean, I know people in Montreal have known you for a while, but, uh, uh, and certainly they might know your dad or your family, but last year you were the new kid 
uh, the, the the renegade young director in his late 20s who comes in with the Trotsky. This year, uh, just by virtue of being the second year you're here, now you're the grizzled veteran. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> you're, you're like, oh, that old guy, we did him last year. Yeah, Jacob Tudor. Yeah, totally. yeah, he's Danny Glover in Lethal Weapon. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so uh, what have you learned from that? Pro How has this experience been different with this film in terms of the way you're treated? And, w and where are you going with this next, your career? Well, I mean, the difference is that we came here last year with a movie that people really liked and I, that, that has never happened to me before um, <laughs> I, it wasn't my first one it was my second film but I'd never made a movie or, or I don't think even acted in a film that people liked the way they liked Trotsky where people would just stop me on the street and be like oh god I love that movie you know say really sweet things to me and really really kind stuff and so I definitely feel a, a lot of goodwill out of this festival and out of the audiences at this festival that responded so strongly to Trotsky and it was very cool last night um, to hear again how many people not just like the new movie but how, how much Trotsky he stays with them. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty funny to be put in that. I, I know, like when, when you know, when TIFF started announcing, and they were like veteran filmmakers like Bruce McDonald, Jacob Tierney, and Xavier Dolan. And Xavier, Xavier called He's me. He's twenty one. Like, I know. He yeah. was like, Do you know, you know, we're still younger than all of those first films. You know, like we're still. And I was like, I know. It's okay. It's gonna be okay. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's just that that that's fine. I'm I'm happy. You know, it is my third film. It's my third film at the festival as a director, and so. It's, you know, I, I don't expect to be treated like a first-time filmmaker. I'd probably be offended if, <laughs> if I was. I keep treating him like a first-time filmmaker. He does. That <laughs> right, is correct. Right, right. That is correct. But you still do the work for him. Right? Whatever, to, whatever he asks. You'll take the dry cleaning. You'll I take, told him. It's I the told first him. time every time, though. That's, you know, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> That's what great acting is about. First time every time. <laughs> Guys, it's such a pleasure. As Likewise, thank you so buddy. much. Thank you for having you us. Know, yeah, you're you're welcome it. anytime. And congrats on this. And, and I look forward to people seeing this film. Cheers, Yeah, me too. Thanks so much, eh? That is filmmaker Jacob Tierney and actor Jay Baruchel joining me here in Studio Q. Their latest film, Good Neighbors, had its world premiere at the 2010 Toronto International Film Festival.